Hello and welcome back to the Cyberspace Podcast by Empirical Training. My name is Josh, I'm one-fourth of Empirical Training and joined with me today, I have the full house of the Empirical Trainers. We've got Robbie, cybersecurity leader and consultant, um, fancier title than that, Robbie, forgive me. Vaughan, also security operations leader, AI security specialist and cloud security specialist in his, in his current work. Whoop, whoop. AJ, Andrew Jones, this guy is our instant response specialist, works in financial organizations from the really big, big types of financial organizations down to some more kind of newer stuff, um, including some uh, some of the really new cutting edge blockchain technologies. That's a great, great set of experience there. And myself, I'm a, a product uh, specialist, former security analyst, uh, working for a global cybersecurity company. So there's the credentials. This is the Cyberspace podcast. You might probably haven't heard us before. What we like to do is talk about cybersecurity uh, issues in a very accessible way way we've all come from quite unorthodox backgrounds into cybersecurity, and there was a real stigma we all felt when we started that you had to pretend you knew everything that you couldn't ask the stupid question or, or go home and, and cry yourself to sleep so this is about having a kind of open and friendly form where we can talk about things I did that yeah it's okay not <laughs> to know google is your friend even on the job even the best security yeah. analysts even if they won't admit it they're googling stuff on the regular so every day we- we're going to be your Google. We're going to be your chat GPT because we're going to deliver it to you in a much better way than either of those uh, can. And we have a fifth member of the podcast today, um, which is our chat. So we have a school community, that's school with a K, um, 1.8 thousand uh, and growing, where it's a collection of like-minded individuals wanting to build their cybersecurity knowledge, get into it, or kind of advance their their careers, or just, just chat security. So we've actually got loads of them on right now. They're going to be jumping questions in. We're going to be answering them. And the topic today is really just what we've discussed in our community over the last few weeks um, and see where that takes us and see where they take us with their questions. Thank you very much, chat. Round of applause for the chat for their attendance. Yeah, chat. Welcome to the Q&A. Yeah. <laughs> whoop, whoop. <laughs> that was great energy. So we've got a question to start us off. I think we'll start with questions. Um, put this one up on the stage 12 in the chat as well this is good going i'm enjoying this what was one of your most memorable experiences in the field for all gurus slash mentors who wants to go first great um that's a that's a big question we should have i should have thought about preparing this but instead uh, (laughs) what we did all that intro just just in general in in everyone's careers yeah uh I i guess for me was the first job that I was in when I was really new and there was a big breach and I just remember being quite scared (laughs) (laughs) and I didn't really know what was happening and I don't even think I was involved in the war room but that's what happened so there's a there was a customer reported event and the customer was breached and immediately they wanted to assemble a war room so they created a separate room and you know brought the best analysts in that company took them off their day job and they had to concentrate fully on that breach and you know it's uh, root cause analysis time so they need to dig through the logs and try and piece together what's happened and you know create all of that information for the incident uh, response timeline I can just remember there was like, I don't know, you could, you could just feel the intensity in the air. Yeah. Yeah. The very first one when I first joined. Yeah. Yeah, I remember. Um, (laughs) And I I just thought, wow, that was like pretty cool. I really enjoyed it. Even though I wasn't even involved, just watching and seeing the, the updates and everything. That was just a cool moment. So that's probably the one that sticks out for me. That one, I was not part of that, but actually that made me terrified as well because for some reason my start date and that same company kept getting pushed back by days and then weeks. And I was like, uh-oh, is this a kind of soft firing before I've even started? But it was because that exactly that reason, no one had any time for anything other than the war room. Um, so it was pretty cool kind of coming back. You were all kind of riding off that high and were pretty buzzing about it. And uh, that customer never made the news, right? So even though it was a kind of a missed attack and there's a lot of work going on, I don't think it got that big. So job done. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, no, I remember that one. Because uh, for some context as well, we have a lot of 
uh, where we've all worked at the same company, some of us at different times. Um, but yeah, I remember that one. And like you say, you could cut the tension with a knife. And I remember a lot of the more senior analysts had to, you know, some of the tasks they were doing were quite repetitive that they had to grab huge amounts of P caps, um, packet captures of network traffic. And they were basically just sifting through these huge, huge files. Um, and it seemed at the time I didn't have a clue what they were doing. But looking back now, I'd be like, oh, even though I'm a, even if I was a senior analyst, you might be a bit annoyed doing stuff like that. But sometimes that's where it comes to, depending on the company that you're working for, that maybe you just need to capture as much network traffic as possible and kind of sift through it manually or push it back through um, the network IDS to try and detect anything that was there. But yeah, that was definitely a really good one. That was probably my first taste of like a, a real incident as well. Yeah. And people, we love our projects in the community because that's the best way to get experience without having to have a job. And packet capture that that AJ just mentioned, Wireshark is that tool. If you, I know some mm. people have been working on that in in the community, and that's well worth checking out. Um, intimidating to start, but the more you look through it, the more you get familiar with where the data is and what it's telling you. Um, but yeah, that's we want to be writing analytics and detections that pick out the points of interest for us. But ultimately. There are times where you don't know where to look and you just have to kind of boil the ocean almost and start start taking a punt on your different theories in these big raw data dumps. And that's exactly, well, that's, that's not often what a packet capture could be. Sometimes you might have a little inkling of a certain co host or an IP address you're trying to find within the packet captures. Vaughn, do you have any uh, memorable experiences that, that jumped out to you? I do. I, I have two that come to mind and I'm trying to decide which one to talk about. The, the first one is related to a customer actually letting us know about a ransomware note um, that they found. Um, that one's not super interesting because I wasn't really involved with it. However, the other one, being a more security leader based role now, one of the main things we try to do is provide value for our customers. So the one that comes to mind for me mostly is having a new customer coming through onboarding they had no security solutions in the past at all we was their first sock during the onboarding phase which is the phase a customer goes through when they are getting started with a sock is when we start plugging in the seam to the different endpoints and their servers to start receiving logs over to the seam solution we actually fired an incident that was a bit benign at first we wasn't sure what was going on with it but after a bit further digging we actually identified that they had a form of malware on one of their servers that had been dormant for like three or four months that they had no idea about so that was a massive win for us because at the moment we're a relatively small company just coming out with a startup so having that instant impact of the second the server was plugged into our solution finding this dormant malware was a massive massive win and, and something i'll always remember mm -hmm. Nice. That Do you remember how they found how they found it? Was it signature detection or Yeah, it was in using Microsoft Sentinel, analytical rule detection, pinged off. It was I can't remember exactly what it was. I think it was either some sort of scheduled task or uh, a cron job or something was in place. It was nice. speaking in every now and again, but obviously because they didn't have the, the log correlation and, and the identification of the logs as they were being uh run in terms of the scheduled tasks mm. obviously nothing had picked it up before and the second it was plugged in it pinged off traced it back to the root cause analysis and found the exact moment that the file was even dropped on the machine which is pretty oh, nice. oh that's cool Very that's nice. the dream scenario isn't it to have a new customer say yeah we can provide value we can we can keep your your environment secure and you plug it in find something they're like yeah. shit and then it <laughs> kind of serious, backs yeah. up that they actually need it yeah, yeah, it was a pretty awesome moment and a massive win for us being a, a smaller company. And you said it was dormant malware. Does that does that mean that it was when it was beaconing back to wherever home was, it wasn't getting any instructions to no. kind of take the next steps? It was just waiting. Yeah. They had absolutely no idea that it was even there. They had seen nothing exfiltrated. I'm not sure whether they had done their job and just left it laying around. We, yeah. we hadn't found anything regarding our company on dark web resources or anything but yeah it was there and and it wasn't actually doing anything so who knows what they were intending mm -hmm. yeah but it's like it's like stopping a ticking time bomb i was it <laughs> reminds me of those it's like et phoning home and then when he gets the right password come passwords come back to him becomes oh he's, i'm a russian sleeper spy all of a sudden stuff <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> right, chopping drives. Files. yeah yeah <laughs> Oh, nice that's a weird i mean mine's mine's a little softer because i kind of i was thinking more recently um to in my career 
um, and having stepped away from the kind of day-to-day -day security analyst stuff, it, mine was is the first time I gave um, a, a talk, an in-person talk at one of the security conf conferences um, because, oh, Jenny Mac, that was terrifying. You know, I, I think it was about ransomware. Yeah, that's um, so scary. Yeah, it's it huge, was, man. It's a huge done, achievement. <laughs> cheers, bud. Yeah, we've done a we've done a kind of co a task with our threat intelligence teams of mapping like the most common uh, vulnerabilities within a ransomware attack sequence. So you know, what are, mm. it, it, hey, hey, if you've got so little time, what are the kind of five vulnerabilities I would tell you to make sure you don't have you in your environment because they pop up so often. That was the kind of the idea, and at a. I, I remember i think i probably spent more time researching for that talk than anything else i've ever done and so i was queued up to the nines <laughs> if there was going to be one like security wizard in there who would just say nope need more detail or like kind of ask me all these questions um <laughs> it does it gets a little bit easier but i still find myself over preparing because you never know who's going to be in that audience we might get a, like one of our chat members trying to ask us some of these extreme uh, uh, questions but yeah that was that was a cool one and if anyone's joined us late, this is we are recording the Cyberspace podcast right now. Uh, the chat are our fifth presenter, so we're taking questions from the chat and, and and discussing topics we've seen within the community as well. So great to see some new faces in there. There's some people I don't don't recognise, and some people looking for kind of mentorship and guidance. You're in the right space, and ho hopefully we can help you give you the energy to get get to keep on your journey to cybersecurity and give you a little bit of knowledge when as and when you need it when you can't find it yourself, but. That's a good segue there for the next question then. <clears throat> well, it's not yeah, quite but... a question, it's more of a statement. I'm a new cybersecurity, I'm new to cybersecurity. I'm looking for mentorship to help guide me. Who's got the sales, who's got the sales out on then? <laughs> wow, funny you should say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do uh, have access you... to the four of us um, in, in yeah. a medium like this. This is, um, we are doing this in our kind of free community. There is a paid for community um, as well, the gold tier where we have load of courses that kind of get you to be a better security analyst than we were on the day one of our jobs that was kind of the, the the premise we had in mind when building it and also we can we can guarantee a little bit more time from us to kind of help you out with any specific uh, mentorship you might need weekly check-ins um, and so on so yeah we can definitely do a little bit from here but if you did want to get the elevated piece it this is the try before you buy, <laughs> but uh, whatever whatever suits where you are uh, in, in, on your journey and where you are, your budget and things like that, because there's a lot you can do for free as well. But if you want that extra guaranteed attention, that's that's the way to get it. Yeah, and I think um, looking at the free community as well, I assume that's where you've come from. Take If you're new to that community, have a look at the classroom courses. We've just released uh, our gamified approach to helping you um, build your own pathway and roadmap to becoming a cybersecurity analyst. So that's always a great place to start. Um, like Josh said, it all depends on, on budget. And we understand that cybersecurity training can be expensive, um, but we also think it can be a little bit boring sometimes. So we try to make it a bit fun. So that's definitely a good place to start. And we're always in that free community as well. So you may not get the same level of mentorship as you do in the gold, but we're always posting. We're always responding to people's questions in that free community. So you really want to be making the most out of that um, as it continues to grow. <clears throat> um, because the, the less people in there now, the quicker we can respond to those questions in the free one. So it's, it's, it's a great opportunity in there. And make sure that you keep asking questions as well. A lot of people do just sort of like to linger in the background and, and watch what's going on and chuck a couple of likes here and there. But don't be afraid to ask some questions. There's no such thing as a silly question in the empirical training school community. So ask the questions. There's going to be people that are going to be willing to to help you out and uh, and answer those questions, and we're we're there as well. But there are also good. other people that are in there that are in the same position as you, so that's got to be comforting. Yeah, for sure. That's what I was going to say. There's probably people that are thinking the exact same thing that, that you're thinking in terms of question, and and you'll actually be helping them out at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and it's all about taking action as well, isn't it? Because if you don't, then all you're doing is just holding yourself back from achieving your dreams man yeah achieve the dreams man yeah it's you're not gonna have a perfect deal i'm a bit of a lurker i think we covered this before i would i would sit in a community and wait for a while until i felt comfortable to kind of really start posting or whatever but that's just putting yourself in the right <clears throat> environment is going to be conducive to to getting you in the down the cyber security journey um you're not going to be on it every day you know you've probably got your other your day job other stuff you want to got to be doing but just having that environment you might never know when it catches a, a, a spark of motivation um hmm that's that's what i think i love about being in communities like this and on the theme of no stupid questions we have one from pierre he says would you rather fight 10 horse-sized ducks or one <laughs> duck-sized oh i got it wrong <laughs> <laughs> well 
where's the question i made that up but <laughs> oh, I'm scrolling down then <laughs> i was looking for it too yeah. i think we got a question from dj dj i'm going to put you up on the screen because you, you don't you just have your initials um which which is which is good so is if you can create a list of tools that you use on a daily basis in the field what are those top five tools that will get the job done this is a Big question. I like I like mm -hmm. the way you're thinking. It's a hard one to answer because it depends what kind of thing you're you're trying to do. So, in the context, boys, that we have a kind of blue team security analyst. Maybe let's just go around and pick one tool that you're really fond of and, and kind of say what it does <clears> and something you kind of you, it's saved in your bookmarks. You use it regularly. What would that be? For me, it would definitely be the Micro Attack framework. When triaging incidents and trying to identify attack vectors and trends and what attackers are doing the micro attack framework is going to be your number one go-to for categorizing the different exploitation stages of the chain that an attacker will go through all the way from reconnaissance to when they're scanning trying to figure out what devices and machines are on a network all the way over to impact where they're actually performing actions on objectives in terms of destroying data exfiltrating stuff um shutting down machines all sorts of things so I like having my attack framework open just so you can see, okay, this is the capabilities of an attacker. Does what I'm looking at in terms of a security incident fit into these categories? Hmm. So how does that help you? Because I, I, they have some procedures, but they, which procedure being the like exact string of an attack, which would be helpful. But sometimes mm -hmm. you don't have that and they only fill up so many of them. So like, what what what, what is it, the context? What, what context benefits yeah. you from understanding where the attack is at? Yeah, the, for working with Microsoft Sentinel, um, the incidents are always tagged with a relevant MITRE attack technique. So trying to cross-reference that relevant technique against what we're seeing in the incident to see if this is legitimately activity of issue or just something that's benign is, is something that's super beneficial. Nice. So kind of working out what, what the kind of overall goal was then saying, does this thing I'm seeing achieve that goal, the attacker? Yep. If so... Yeah, I mean, the way I've always used it as well is uh, if you want to kind of put yourself into what well, the next steps of the attacker, like, yep, I found this incident. I know it's uh, lateral movement, say. Um, where does that fit on the the, the attack, might attack framework? What might I think they want to jump to next? Because certain ones you know, make more logical sense to move on to because <clears throat> we're kind of almost racing to kind of catch the attacker before, get ahead of the attacker before they can progress beyond us, get to that end objective. Mm -hmm. Do you use the might to defend at all, Vaughan? Um, you can say can no. <laughs> yeah, no, it can definitely go hand in hand with the Might Attack framework. Just throwing frameworks out there, one I use a lot more is the React framework. AJ, you're probably familiar with this one, which is the Instant Response yeah. framework. A lot of my work at the moment is giving kind of consultation stuff to companies around the IR preparedness and what stages we can cover them for and what stages they need to do themselves. So the React framework goes through that step by step from initial identification all the way over to lessons learned at the end with containment eradication and all of those things in between. So a lot of my time now on these consultation based IR calls, I spend just going through like the roles and the racy matrix between that and, and what we provide for customers. Well, I, I actually like didn't this. know there was a might to defend. Um, yeah. Not good. No, that's actually the first ever. Oh, I didn't know there was a, a React framework, which isn't owned yeah. by Mitre, but based off it. it no, seems. I didn't. I think you might have mentioned it before. It's not something that I've used, though. Mm. Actually, I'm going to dive into this. This looks pretty handy because it kind of... It, the, the defend matrix is quite is, is incomplete. It's kind of almost... It's asking for community members to kind of add stuff to oh, it okay. cause there's so much to do. But it's like, hey, if you see this attack, what, are, what is a detection you could write? What is a mitigation you could write? You could uh, add? Um, what is a mediation recommendation? So it's kind of like a, a kind of group think of, of all those collections. And sometimes you might find what you're looking for and often you'll find incomplete data. But this, is, this is a bit broader, Vaughan, just looking at a glance at it, but I kind of like mm -hmm. it. It's kind of... It's actually... I feel like this would be a lot better at the kind of leadership level of what you actually need to do. Yeah, kind of... that's that's where a lot of my data is. There's also one called Mitre Shield, which I think they renamed to Mitre Engage, which I'm trying to find, <clears throat> but I can't seem to find it. Well, well, DJ, you got five frameworks, five tools, just in one answer there uh, from Vaughan. <laughs> but uh, does anyone else want to, anything else that they use on a daily basis? So they think that I know we post stuff like this in the the community all the time, anyway, but. Yeah, I, I, it's a simple tool, but I love um, uh, um, criminal IP. Is it? Cri yeah, criminal IP. Io. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> just for looking up, uh, just for looking up IP. Where well, it's a little bit like Shodan, 
um, but it's I use it for IP lookup. So anytime I'm doing an analysis on an attack, I'll use that IP lookup, and it just provides a little bit more information than another one I really like. It's a super simple one. It's a classic, really. Abuse IPDB. Yeah, that's um, my go-to. That one is pretty good. It'll show you if there has been abuse reports on a certain IP address, um, and you can kind of correlate that then to maybe understand if it's um well it's always difficult with ip stuff because vpns and things like that but it's a good database to understand if that ip is currently um, on the internet abusing um applications and things like that but the more in-depth one that i've been using recently is criminal ip.io i think i think virus total is underrated as well because there's a little feature if you create an account <clears throat> gives you like a, a nice little visualization of um of where the ips are resolving mm. and like builds out a nice little graph um obviously you've got cyber chef as well that's a nice yeah. little tool to use yeah so every day encoding good. decoding manipulating data um oh, feels like a cop out for me to say it but like chat gpt is very useful <laughs> as long as you use it correctly and you don't you know abuse it Oh, yeah, you don't abuse it and you um, provide context around the answers that you, that you um, generate, then it can be used for a lot of things, you know, creating some queries. It could be used for potentially mapping out some remediation tactics mm -hmm. pertinent to a particular incident. But yeah, you can't rely on it. You just need to use it to enhance your triage, but not, not, not solely yeah, rely on that for yeah. the answers. Yeah, that's a great point, Rob. Um, one thing I'm kind of falling into the trap at the moment with my analysts uh, at my corporate job is they've been a little over reliant on chat GPT type elements. So yeah. it's almost like we're trying to wean them off that and kind of uh, enforce almost like critical thinking themselves because they're just kind of mm -hmm. resorting back to using these tools like, no, you need to actually think about the problem yourself first and then use that as supporting evidence rather than just going straight to that for your answer. But, yeah, um, otherwise, ChatGPT is pretty shite otherwise. I think if you don't critical <laughs> think, it, uh, if yeah. you don't provide the critical thinking and the actual knowledge, then <clears throat> if you give it a generic, well, I guess it's garbage in, garbage out, isn't it? Exactly. And <clears throat> another yeah. thing I'd recommend as well is if you are looking to use a ChatGPT type tool, um, ChatGPT's data set, if I, I'm not sure about 4.0, but I'm pretty sure the data set of 3.5 only goes up to January 2019, 2021. Whereas if you use a browser like Edge, I know Edge is shit, but I mean, just for this feature alone, Edge has security co-pilot from Microsoft embedded into the browser. So you can literally press a little button up in the top right to open up ChatGPT type browser window inside your current browser. And you can actually use that large language model to do commands and pull back information. And the benefit about Edge is unlike ChatGPT that gets limited based off of his data set, it's up to current date. So it has everything up to the present day. So there's no limitations on past data. I think also be careful as well what you're doing with <clears throat> what com company information that you're putting yes. in ChatGPT and things like that. It, ultimately, if um, th that data gets compromised, then your company data is in that data set. So you don't want to be putting sensitive information in there. Um, yeah, what we've sure. moved to now is an internal, internally hosted um, form of chat, chat GPT using the chat GPT API key. Um, but again, we still have some issues with that because all of the company information is going into the same place. So it's not quite segregated, but at least it's stayed internally. But again, it's just something to think about when you're putting information in there. That if you're putting company sensitive information in there, you there is yeah. a chance that somebody externally could access it. Yeah, and more so, um, one of the problems that we're facing at the moment with a similar thing that AJ is talking about is any data that does go in there gets added to the training data set. So your mm. customer information, a whole PII, personally identifiable information issue, is now getting added to this massive repository of training data, which your customers obviously don't want. Yeah, you're feeding the beast. And we know yeah. there, there are ways to... <laughs> escape that data you can actually pr examples of just prompts to return other customers data other requesters data um we are probably going to talk in more detail in a short while about some ai related implicate security implications but let's stick stick to the q a for now
um, DJ asked for a list of the, the tools we've written. We'll, we'll definitely post a list of this in the chat, um, uh, at least tomorrow, maybe with the, the go live of this episode. So you can have links to all the ones that we mentioned in case in case you missed it. Um, for me, the, 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 the one that I stick out is probably two I'd mentioned, quick ones, just the uh, it's really basic and it's one I knew before as a security analyst, but have I been pwned.com? I like that one because oh, yeah, that is a great way to kind of show anybody why they <clears throat> care about security. Um, you get them to type their email address in and it will show you um, if they appear in any word list. So have their basically have their credentials been compromised and they are for sale on the dark web. It tells you what apps are associated with. For me, for example, there's an Under Armour one that I was involved in, the My Fitness app oh, yeah, years and years ago. Same. <clears throat> yeah. All of us, yeah, all of us tracking our calories, were we boys trying to get massive? <laughs> well, uh, we almost got compromised. And if we'd use the same passwords for our My Fitness app as we did for our banking or something, and we didn't have MFA enabled, then we'd be compromised. And so that's you know, that's attackers don't just guess your password one 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 anymore. They use word lists. They're smarter than that. So this is why we beat your passwords. This is why we say use things like multi-factor authentication because the majority of attackers are still just basic credential attacks. And so that's how I kind of get people who might think security is completely irrelevant they even sometimes tell me oh but my my password is my dog's name for every single one i use and i'm like one do <laughs> two don't yeah. do that uh, <laughs> so that's that one uh, has anyone else used that before to have a conversation i tried it with my nan that's the only time it didn't work yeah i've definitely had uh, a similar conversation before and, and also to your point josh about your friend using their dog's name i had a, a conversation with a friend before and they were like oh yeah my password is difficult they'll <clears throat> never be able to guess it and attack we all know is a dictionary attack where they literally take words out of the dictionary mm. and i was like oh you know if you want to tell me your password tell me what it is and, and i'm happy to to let you know whether it's good or not and and he was like yeah my password is washing machine <laughs> it's long <laughs> he was like yeah no, no one's ever gonna guess that are they i was like yeah but if you use a dictionary attack they'll literally take the word washing machine and then guess your password <laughs> But yeah, he thought yeah. it was the the most the amazing password ever passwords. because no one's ever going to guess washing machine. Vaughn's um, password rating service is now open if anyone yeah. wants to submit it. Yeah, I know, I know. Submit your passwords. <laughs> and your encrypted, encrypted uh, trans data transfer only, please. Uh, do, do you know what? Do you know on the Have I Been Pwned website? I actually did a post about it. There's there's a space where you can actually input a password and it'll let you know if it's part of that massive database that have i been pwned have got access to oh interesting i do yeah, i'm not sure i trust that yeah i know <laughs> yeah i know it's a bit it is a bit sus in it because then if you're adding to that then where does that yeah, yeah. That's, where, that's where does, what, what database is that getting entered into and they could capture or what is it querying sure. yeah yeah capture your request in ip address then they know the machine you're using you probably <laughs> Yeah, Take with that, they can work out what you're logging into. Yeah. Sorry. I, <laughs> I wouldn't advise anybody to be inputting their actual password, maybe like an old one or something, or just a test one. Because I did it the other day. I put a test one in. I think I did well, password one, two, three, and then it came <laughs> up, flashed, flashed red and said, danger. Mm. <laughs> danger danger but well, there's a there is another one similar to have a been put on called pentester.com uh, but that will actually re scan the dark web well it says it scans the dark web everybody says that i don't know if it actually does that um and, oh, it, oh, and it'll, it'll pull back the um the passwords as well so i've actually tried it and it did pull back one of my old passwords so it's scanning them from old leaks basically so it's, it's surprisingly quite easy to find those leaked passwords and you have to pay for what for your passwords get pulled right it'll do like an initial scan and then it'll it do a free, yeah it'll do a free one and then you do have to pay for it yeah i haven't paid for it just uh check the free one out and dark web scanning is a great way for op like open source <clears throat> intelligence right anything that's on the dark web you can you look for the, the common way people do it i think it's worth talking about for for our audience um you can search for like your brand names so say you work for mm -hmm. um what's a generic company name um what's that one on looney tunes all the time acme Acme, yeah. So, um, you know, acme.com, at Acme, you just search for anything that pops up there. You might see email addresses of your compromised employees, and it might have password links to it. You might just see mentions in in kind of initial access broker forums where, where they've hacked, they've got an entry, and they're trying to sell their entry to somebody else. Um, you, you might not be that obvious. They might not try and use your actual name, but they might use something. I have access to certain hosts, the name conventions. You can also search the kind of host naming conventions. So it's, it's quite easy, really. It's just a kind of mm -hmm. way of using, basically Googling the, the, the dark web, um, 
using some advanced kind of dorking searches, you can automate it. But in my experience, the one we've tried to do, the biggest headache is GDPR. So if you're doing it for your company, it's easy. If you try and do it for other people, it's really hard oh, okay. to make sure you categorize the data safely and you get rid of it and et cetera, because you have oh, to find sense. data you didn't mean to find. If that makes sense. Um, mm, yeah, that makes sense. So yeah, it's, it's quite difficult to sell as a service, but people do, people do. There's, a good, there's another good segue there. We've actually had a question that was towards the start of the podcast about OSINT. Um, so I have a question. If we want to get going in OSINT, do we need certifications like Security Plus or can we study for the same and directly jump into it? So what do you, I have a different opinion, I think, than what you guys are going to say. So can we start with mine? Yeah, yeah go for it. Then. Go I, don't think, I don't think you need certs. I think I've studied for more certs than I've ever taken the exam for. Um, you can yeah. often, that's what I normally do is I find a cert that I think is interesting. I study, I normally don't even finish it and then I move on. Um, that's just me. That's what works for me. And that doesn't get you hired. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> but so if you've already got a job though, that's good. Cause yeah, I, I pretty much did that with all of the CompTIA content. The sans stuff too, right? There's some sans pieces. Um, but yeah, I've not had the budget to forward the sands or had anyone sponsor me to go through one of those. Um, yeah, I, I tried to Google Doc some sands resources on, on Google and yeah, you couldn't find anything. No. But yeah, in terms of actually getting into OSINT, I've like worked in teams where there's been OSINT analysts when I was working for a bank, but I've always noticed that currently where I am now, it's usually the cybersecurity analysts who have then gone from there and upskilled into OSINT. And it's kind of the, one of the things that we mentioned that cybersecurity analyst is usually the, the best route to go in as because there is usually the lower barrier of entry. But I, I always say that it's not an easy job. It's still, there's still a lot to learn, but you get exposed to a lot of different areas. So that's always one way you can try and get in because I've work, well, worked with a couple of people that have gone on to do OSINT after. In terms of going straight in and doing OSINT, um, you can use something like OSINT Dojo. So that teaches you a lot of the basics of OSINT. Um, probably a lot of that you could learn at home. Like uh, most of OSINT, and I probably should, shouldn't should downplay it as much, is a lot of like Google searching and grabbing as much data as you can and trying to make some decisions on that data rather than being super technical. I might be wrong. I haven't done a lot of uh, OSINT to be fair. Um, but I think if there should be no reason that you can't learn it from home and try and get in from there. But if you are struggling there, maybe go down the route of a cybersecurity analyst because there's more of those jobs available and then look at specializing into OSINT. And then you've got that background of being in cybersecurity. Then you're learning OSINT and then you can go towards or even create your own job um, through that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, from, from my opinion, personally, I've never actually seen a role for an OSINT analyst. Maybe it's just the, the areas I've been exposed to. However, if you're going to learn to become an OSINT analyst or you want to get good at OSINT, I would definitely recommend putting yourself in the environment where you're kind of going to be forced to use the OSINT. So the war AG is saying security analyst or SOC analyst, that's probably going to be one of the number one places that you're going to be quote unquote forced for like the instant triage aspect to use and conduct OSINT. And then you also get the benefit of learning off peers that are also very good at OSINT in, mm -hmm. and at stages in front of you. So I would definitely recommend looking at a security analyst base position, like AJ saying, to learn the OSINT. Then you can either decide whether you want to go for an OSINT specific position or maybe stay as an analyst. Yeah. And OSINT is, is really broad, right? But a lot of OSINT is just following yeah. the right people on Twitter and who will pick these yeah, pieces out for true. you, let you know about the latest indicators of compromise, and then you you can go and apply those out. Um, you're just being abreast of those. And that's why, you know, AJ said it's everyone's job, really, to be an open source intelligence. Um, people will say, hey, I saw this article. They're like, oh, that's really cool. And they go and apply that into whatever tool it is you've got. The probably, if you, you know, the techniques themselves are you kind of, you'll find those as they go through some of them basic. Some of them do require kind of big data analytics. But I think, would I be right in saying it's like the, the data lake tools? I think Colliery was the one I was familiar with, but I did a quick search. I don't know if it's spelt differently. I couldn't find it. Um, is that the one we used to use, guys, when we were together? Um, it Ooh, uses Yara remember. rules to to search for stuff. Well, that sounds familiar. Yeah. I gotta, I, well, I, I couldn't find it. One. Maybe I'm wrong. But Kibana is, is a, another one. There's other things. Another, like, that. like direct threat um osint to our well, threat intelligence uh, threat connect that's one that um the bank was using where it was previously 
Mm. And there is another there is another one as well. I can't remember what it's called. Now, My point about having that data storage is right, it's one thing to kind of go and do the OSIN. It's another to collect it in an area where it becomes useful and you can actually start applying mm. it. So that's the kind of second part of OSIN, I think, and start building up your repository, automating some bits to go periodically scan and grab um, and, and populate things that are in there. I think that would be the best way to show to an employer that you are not only do you know OSINT, but you you have mm. ways of applying it. I think that's almost more important. Otherwise, it's just that word of mouth scenario I talked about earlier, which does work. It's just hard to scale. Yeah, yeah. yeah my, uh, my company is actually thinking about creating a. I think it's I don't know kind of what it's called VIP profiling service, security service. So, you know, if it's like a CEO of a business or some high profile client can pay and then basically we will conduct OSINT specifically around their brand or their profile on the internet okay, nice. and, you know produce a report and say like this is how exposed you are you we've grabbed x amount of email addresses here's some password dumps um and then like i guess we're also asking like a series of questions and rating their personal opsec as well yeah, I think I think we're going to be spinning at one of the, one of those services. It'll be pretty cool if we do, and I'll yeah, that is cool. Keep, keep you guys along for the ride on that one. Yeah, nice. It's a great. It's a great. Um, I was going to say switch uh, baiting tool, but it's kind of like I, what I meant is lead generation for kind of security conversations. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> demonstrate free value Bait, and then baiting tool. In, yeah, baiting tool is a bit <laughs> bit cynical, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Um, we've got two questions that are kind of related um, and then I think we might start moving on into the topics of the community the big discussion points we've had uh, for a kind of almost part two of this but the first so we've got ones about do you prefer hack the box over the wire try hack me or any other so this is this question is about um, the capture the flag the tools or websites that are out there where you can simulate um kind of basically in a safe environment in a in a in a legal environment you can try your hand a little bit of hacking to get to a purposely vulnerable environment do the right steps and you can get to the flag which is when you've kind of won and use that flag to show hey i i beat this one almost gives you a game score um, which actually does is taken seriously by employees as well like that employers so definitely for me it's hack the box um that's the one i've only one i've had experience with as well so i'd be happy to be persuaded why the other ones are better but hack the box has a good great reputation and they have a really robust community around not sharing hints or or kind of walkthroughs um which is really important because if that you share the, the how to do it you get the flag who gets the flag it devalues the the flag so they only once they retire boxes do they kind of show hey here's how it happens and people release videos about it which is also a great way to learn it if you're not ready to start um hacking yourself um but yeah being able to do collect, show that you've done those boxes without the tips being out there means you basically can show you your, your rank on the leaderboard and they'll go oh this guy is pretty good uh, at offensive security i might hire them any other thought opinions, boys? Have you used any other ones? I think I know you've probably got more experience than I have. Um, I've got a pretty polarizing view on them. Um, I think it completely depends on what you want to use them for. I do agree with Josh's point about hat the box probably being the best out of the three, um, especially for offensive stuff. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not a massive fan of try hack me. Um, it's good for exposure, but it doesn't it really doesn't have that depth of knowledge. That you can learn on the platform it's nice to get a bit of a generalization but you're not really learning the topics and i think a lot of people really focus on try hack me and and think that it's going to be valid in these interview processes when it, it really isn't going to be and it's, it's nice to see that yeah it does provide a generalization on some of the knowledge but i think people can get caught up in spending too much time on it when that time is better spent learning something that will benefit them if they do mm. want to get into cybersecurity. Yeah, I think you're right. It's all about focusing on what you need to learn that's pertinent to that specific job role. That That's why we've built all of the value that's inside the gold tier, right? It's like cutting out all the noise. Here's what you need to learn to become a SOC analyst. Let's take a look at your skills matrix. Yep. And you can kind of leave everything else for the time being until you get that role. And then you can sort of, you know, cast a wider net in terms of your knowledge competency. Mm. There are a lot of rabbit holes to go down in cybersecurity, and by all means, go down them. But sometimes it, it's nice to have a, that kind of top level advice of, okay, yeah, that is good because everyone, you know, finding your niche is really important in cybersecurity, but yeah, then make sure you pull it back to the core principles, um, which to us make it all make sense. It just ties it all together. 
Um, sometimes you might become an expert in one really narrow thing. And years later, I've actually found out how to apply it because I've kind of had the connective tissue that I didn't know I needed to actually make it relevant. I don't know if, that, if you have that experience as mm. well, gents. Yeah, that's a great analogy, the connective tissue. I love that. There was another question that we did miss, actually. It was, I want to earn some money out of bug bounty opportunities. Any tips for beginners? I guess it does relate to the try hack me, hack the box stuff. Yeah, I think for a tip, the first thing I would recommend is probably becoming very familiar with your Wasp top 10. Um, that's probably where you're going to find the most success with bug bounties attacking these mm -hmm. web applications. So understanding the Wasp top 10 back to front is probably going to be uh, your first protocol, in my opinion. So I would say sign up to an approved bug bounty program. Um, you know, you might yes. get excited and find something, <laughs> but if they're not on a bug bounty program, they might land you in a lot of hot yeah, water when you try and disclose it to them. And you might end up, you know, they realize they can take you to court rather than have to pay you. Uh, also, they don't have to pay you. That's also part of this, right? It's kind of you're doing it out of your own goodness, your heart. And sometimes they don't pay. They, they take the bad choice and then you kind of have to release it out. So it can be a bit of a headache, but go down the approved. I think Google have a really big one. Um, Google are renowned for kind of, you know, there are so many vulnerabilities found uh, in their, them on a weekly basis. If anyone reads kind of patch notes, um, we're always <laughs> yeah, sharing we critical vulnerability in Chrome OS, uh, but that's because they have so many people kind of scrutinizing it with part of their bug bounty program. So have have a look at those sign up for one they often give you kind of rules of engagement as well make sure you conform to those because a bug bounty is great you know you can work from anywhere you hit that one bug you get a couple of tens of thousands of pounds that serves serves you up for a while i know companies that take that that they work together and they all do bug bounties and they kind of share that pool of money as part of the salaries um so it, it is a very lucrative business but there's a lot of people on it a lot of really experienced people as well so it's if that's where you're starting with cybersecurity, you know, you're going to have to be good or very lucky to actually make it a profitable business. I would encourage that to be more of a side project uh, while you focus on um, a more stable, stable job. But if, if that doesn't suit your lifestyle for whatever reason, go ahead. Because it definitely, I know some people who think, who when they found bug bounties, they were like, wow, this this was this was the way I want to live my life. You know, total freedom almost. Um, yeah, and is it Hack, Hacker One? That's one of the most famous ones, isn't it? That's Hacker a good one. one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um if you sign up to that and you can i think they've got a community aspect to it as well and you can kind of potentially work with other um i guess ethical hackers then are looking to work on certain um bug bounties so basically hacker one is a website where companies will post their bug bounty programs and they'll say if you find anything in our uh, web application like vaughn says a lot of it is, is like to do with web applications that's where you see a lot of the vulnerabilities uh, you might be able to work with other researchers and maybe make a bit of money but it is a, probably a side project especially when you're starting out mm. excellent thanks so much for the questions chat this has been a really good one um to have we've, we've had the whole hour of of just questions from the audience now this was scheduled for an hour people probably have lives they might want to jump off if you do that to you Thank you so much for being with us. There's no worries. Um, you by all means jump off. Um, gents, do, do you guys have a bit more time? We can go into some of the other topics that we do rather than just question some of the stuff we discussed. I know there's one that I think is really relevant around the AI uh, pieces. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, can we do one more question? Because I think DJ's yeah. got one more that I, that I really like. He, he said, if you can go back in time to your younger self, what piece of advice would you tell yourself if you were getting into cybersecurity? Ooh, don't do it. It's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> Drive buses. <laughs> yeah, bus driver. There's no on the bus driver route. Where's the bus emojis? Bus emojis in chat, please. Immediately. <laughs> hang, hang. No, but on a serious answer, uh, do you know, I mean, it's, it's quite an interesting for me. That's an interesting question because I didn't see myself going into cybersecurity at all. And I think, you know, maybe that's probably a lot of people in our community as well. It's something you almost stumble across. I think educational areas are getting more institutions are getting more aware that this is a really lucrative career. And so they are pushing people down that road. Um, but yeah, I mean, what advice would I give myself? I think maybe that actually messing up your computer with viruses, trying to download uh, dubious stuff was actually more of a worthwhile task than I realized. And 
uh, my dad, my father was a web designer, and so he knew a bit about computers. But he'd also get very annoyed with me when I would repeatedly brick his uh, his computer that he'd kind of handed down to me, um, trying to trying to download rogue free online games I'd found, uh, <laughs> <laughs> listening to the Kooks on my radio. Those were the good days. Um, but yeah, that line wire. I, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't even that to be actually. I was I was a I was a very poor gamer trying to find MMORPGs. Um, I, but anyway, <laughs> yeah, that, I think that's the, the the kind of the trans the the, the transferable skills that you kind of when you're younger. Um, Pixel, we should be encouraged to know that this is actually going to be helpful in later life. You know, I was told I had terrible handwriting and I was told I couldn't possibly type my exams because I would need to learn how to handwrite and I couldn't bypass that skill. I don't handwrite anything now. I think that's another <laughs> example of how, like, you know, we should encourage these kids to do the to, to, to see the links between what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Minecraft has a great command line. Some of the stuff people do that is incredible. That's incredibly relevant to, to a job. Um, so I think maybe nurturing some more of those areas and making them to feel that they are valuable in the long run, because I had no idea. And I, I don't know if that's a similar experience here. Yeah. Mine would be just ask, be comfortable with asking questions straight off the bat. I was always very wary about asking questions that I was going to feel a little bit stupid and yeah, I didn't want to stand out for not knowing the answer. But as soon as I felt comfortable asking questions, my career went, from strength to strength and and make sure you find the people who if you do get bump into people who make you feel bad for not knowing something then tell them to fuck off and yeah. uh, find the people in your company who are going to mentor you and take you to the next level because once you start asking questions because there's so much to learn as soon as you start asking questions and you say i don't know it's one of the most empowering things ever so just say you don't know and just ask questions that's what i would do yeah AJ, that was an absolutely brilliant one. And honestly, the exact same one I was going to say, I was going to say, get comfortable not knowing the answer. Because um, for me, I like to know things. And when I don't, I, I was a little bit, oh, didn't want to say and ask questions, same as you. But um, yeah, as soon as you can swallow your pride and, and ask a question, yeah. that's when you're going to improve and, and get better. So yeah, don't be afraid of asking questions for sure. Yeah, for me, just enjoy the process and don't put too much pressure on yourself. I think that was something that I did. I put too much pressure on myself and maybe at points I didn't enjoy it as much as I should have and find things that interest you and yeah, concentrate on those, but don't spend too much time on them. Think about the, the bigger picture and put yourself out there. Just volunteer for things and see what happens. Yeah, it was a great one. Mm -hmm. Enjoying the community awesome stuff but we're going to leave it there right we could keep going with all these questions the questions do keep flooding in and i think that's testament to the good conversation that we've had um from the empirical training members robbie vaughan aj and myself josh but mainly from the chat the questions that we've had from the chat today have been fantastic really loved the amount of engagement there there were so many questions we couldn't even pick them all out we had to kind of go back to them people kind of discussing riffing off the back of what we were talking about as well amongst themselves really love to see it so thank you so much to um the the community for this this live q a podcast uh, you really made this one special and looking forward to doing more of these this was only our second live q a uh, podcast but if you're listening and you're thinking wow i wish i could have been involved in that i have some questions i would like to get answered in this safe cyberspace that we have created then you can it's very easy go to www.school with a k.com slash cybersec and you'll be taken to our free cybersecurity community we post all sorts of stuff in there, whether it's just about life, whether it's about cybersecurity. And it's a really community-led discussion, a lot of engagement, a lot of different people working on projects, some people asking who would win in a superhero fight between Teresa X and uh, Magneto, things like that. It's, it keeps it fun. It keeps it entertaining. Get yourself in there. You never know. You might find yourself uh, really getting into cybersecurity if you haven't even thought about it so far it's interesting it applies to everyone's life even if you don't think that this is a kind of a, a career opportunity for you but if you do think that this is a career you want to get into that's a great place to be find your mentors find your community so you can ask the stupid questions and get the clever answers because uh, that's really what is what, what, what we would have loved to have had when we first started out on our cybersecurity journey so thank you so much for listening. Thank you, the listener. Thank my co-hosts, Robbie, AJ, Vaughan, again. Uh, money, and thank you to the chat so much for, for making this one a very interesting uh, com set of conversations and guiding us all over the place, really. I really like the different directions that we took from the 
what inspired you most? What was the kind of big, hey, this what a great moment I've made it in cybersecurity to what tools you use when it comes to analyzing macros and uh, pieces like that. So thank you again so much. You want to get involved, you know where to find us in the school community. Uh, if that not, you want to just keep listening, or if you're already in the community, then we'll see you next week. Thanks so much for listening. This is the Cyberspace Podcast by Empirical Training, and that is a wrap. I think that might be it. I think that's a wrap.